panel discussion. DEI for business growth challenges and opportunities. I would like to invite on stage on that and I'll request you all to kindly welcome them with a proper round of applause for this one. I love that OCD is coming into play even before the conversation starts. Fantastic. All right. Over to you. So, um, thank you. Thank you, E4M team, for having us here. Uh, this is a topic very close to my heart for multiple reasons. Um, the first, of course, uh, I think as a woman, it is something uh, that has been in a lot of discussion recently, like we discussed as a group as well. And uh, also because I think more and more as we see the world around us, uh, we are finding people who are diverse. We are finding lives which are very diverse from the way we have lived in the past. And perhaps as we go ahead, it will become only more and more different. You know, So uh, we thought it's an interesting topic for us to uh, sort of wrap our minds around. And I think the first question that I would like to ask our panelists is, uh, you know, what does DEI really mean? Because there is a very, um, in a way, narrow definition where most of the people think that it's, it's just about men versus women, and if we have solved that issue, we have solved for DEI. Uh, does that uh, really mean that? And uh, let me start with you, Narayan. You know, as the chief strategy officer, maybe what's, what's your view on what does DEI really mean? Thank, thank you, Aditi. Uh, I'm actually going to take off my Dentsu hat for a minute. Uh, there is another hat that I've been wearing for the last one year. Um, I've, I've been uh, in the social sector. I've uh, functioned as the chief strategy officer for the National Foundation of India. And I've immersed myself very deeply into the social impact sector. And I'm almost militant now about this topic. Right? Uh, and and it, I'm going to say some uncomfortable things. Uh, it, it almost feels like we are so, so shallow in our industry over here with how we approach this perspective, this topic. Uh, exactly like you said, right? I mean, we, we look at the surface level and we go on and we believe it's enough to frame the policy and put out some, you know, one day for change kind of initiatives and, and be done with it. Even just within the country that we live in, right? I mean, we, we ape so much of what the West puts down as DEI initiatives and policies and frameworks and perspectives. Geographic diversity, neuro-linguistic diversity, uh, socioeconomic diversity, community, caste. Uh, I mean, I, I would have loved for something like the, the Dalit Chamber of Commerce to have a voice here right now today, right? Uh, but we're all probably of the same uh, color orientation perspective framework over here. Uh, and sometimes I wonder if we spend enough time even looking at whether we have enough self-awareness about how we are approaching this and then get to the question of how do we actually frame the question of what do we mean by diversity? What do we mean by equity? Which is about principles of fairness, regardless of what you're, where you are on the diversity spectrum. And about inclusiveness, which actually is probably the one letter that we, 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 we pay the least attention to. Um, so maybe we just need to take a really hard look at ourselves in the first place to see if we even are aware of the spectrum that diversity is about, the true meaning of what equity can bring to the table, and what do we actually do about being inclusive, right? Uh, sorry, I didn't mean to to be uh, make people uncomfortable right off the bat, but I actually, no, actually I did intend to do that. <laughs> no, no, that's, that's perfect, Narayan, because I, I do strongly feel in another area, I think as a mother that I, I want to uh, talk about is also, uh, you know, the diversity in learning. You know, our, our educational system is designed in a way which uh, sort of rewards only one kind of learning, and, and that's possibly not going to hold us well in the future. So when we start looking at diversity, and, and therefore how do we build solutions which uh, bring in equity, which allow us to include people in, in growth for everyone, it is going to be very important for us to be able to identify and, and sort of address these things. Uh, Paul, let me uh, let me go to you and, and ask this question because you know as, as a brand uh, custodian in a way, uh, you have been looking at 
different aspects of diversity, are trying to identify groups or cohorts who are different, who have needs which are different, and, and then try to create solutions with them. Uh, how has that worked out for you? Um, so I just, uh, I'm so glad that you started off with this question uh, about diversity. And uh, since 2015 onwards, we have been working uh, in our communication and internally keeping diversity at the core. But like Narayan said, I think we all have a very myopic view about diversity. And from a brand perspective, especially from a skincare brand perspective, uh, men, women, we are the largest subset. Uh, it's a huge, um, large number to be addressed. While in, in the course of journey into from 2015 onwards, I think I happened to work on a campaign with acid attack survivors. Uh, why I wouldn't get much into the details because we have time constraint because we were a skincare brand and we wanted to address uh, one extra layer of skincare other than oily, yeah. uh, sensitive, and uh, dry skin. And that's when we figured out the acid attack and the burn victim. When I worked there, uh, I, real I was working with a lot of NGOs. And I realized that every year around 500 to 700 cases are registered. And uh, around 200, 250 are the ones who survive. Yeah. Now that is a very small number for representation as such. But the question is, do we need to represent it? Is it important? Yeah. Until unless the number of such diversity group is big, it does not get the focus of often media, also brands. And at the same time, is it enough to talk or is it enough to do something for them in terms of your product or service offerings as well? So that was a big question and how do you take that forward? So uh, that made us think that diversity just not, does, we can't only focus on diversity when the group is huge mm -hmm. and they need a representation. Even smaller groups at various size combination need representation. Second point, what he touched upon is when you look at equity and inclusiveness, I think the biggest problem is we, while addressing that, we often uh, work from a space of sympathy and not empathy. Yes, yes. Because the moment you work from a space of empathy, it will require a lot of self-actualization. It requires a lot of listening and therefore coming up with solution. It cannot operate uh, as a society, as brands, as media representatives, X, Y, Z. If you were talking of diversity, inclusiveness, equity, you can't operate from a space of sympathy. That's when it gets into a very studio space. You have to be empathetic enough to understand, listen, address the issue if you can. And as a brand, I also feel not necessary that I will be representing all of it but the ones that I want to represent and talk about should be strong enough and should be inculcated at the core of business and should be able to try and you know, I should be able to manifest it through my product, my services, my communication and everything that I do around it. Perfect. I, I love this uh, sympathy versus empathy and I'm going to circle back to it. But uh, before we go there, I want to ask Vishesh a question. Vishesh, you represent a category which is uh, typically in, in all our minds, you know, very male. You know, paisa sochna hai to papa batayenge, bhaiya batayenge. Maybe the husband is taking care of finances. And uh, that sector, I mean, that, that's one side of it, which is how the consumer thinks. Uh, today, if we have a banking conclave, you know, any financial conclave, you, you go there and, and it's all men. There, there is uh, very little diversity even within those men. So, uh, so tell us a bit about your sector. You know, how, how are you looking at DEI? Is, is that important? Is, is that relevant? Uh, what should be done? So, good evening to you, Aditi, my co-panelists and the audience. I hope you are having an insightful evening. Uh, the problem uh, of being asked to speak in the end is that your co-panelists have already covered the ground and you're left with nothing to add to what they've already said. Uh, fortunately or unfortunately, that's what happens with me. Every panel, you know, I'm asked in the end, uh, you know, but this time I uh, asked chat GPT. So that is something which no one has covered so far. So I was just, you know, while coming, I asked chat GPT that, you know, what according to you is uh, DIAI, or what do you understand of DIAI? So Chat GPT responded, since I am an artificial intelligence, I'm supposed to have no views on DIAI, 
but I can share the information which I believe is relevant. And uh, what ChatGPT said that DII is not just a moral responsibility. Problem being at the leadership level in our corporate sector, we tend to think of it as a moral responsibility rather than just thinking of it as a business ecosystem which we need to build. Though things are changing, I'm not saying, uh, you know, it's still relevant, but things are changing at a very slow pace. Okay, so uh, coming back to our industry, fortunately or unfortunately, you know, uh, that's the harsh truth that in financial world, you'll see a lot more mail, the products even uh, being pitched by mail to the mail, even all the insurance ads which you see talk about, you know, how he would have left probably a bigger insurance for kids and family and everything. So, uh, see, when you look at DII, you cannot just talk about having the token representation that, okay, if I'll just have a couple of women in my team, I'll just fulfill the responsibility. DII is looking at the whole ecosystem, which also includes probably, let's say, people with physical disabilities. You know, nobody talks about them. I mean, at least I have not seen any ad, any brochure, any marketing material promoting any insurance policy or any product specifically for the physically disabled, you know, class. Similarly, you know, transgenders, you know, I haven't come across anyone selling anything to them or for them. So when you look at diversity, when you look at inclusivity, it has to be both from within the company and to your consumer also. That's when you look at the whole ecosystem and that's probably a uh, very far-fetched thought right now, but at least let's start talking about it so that, you know, the sooner we reach there, the better. Yeah, these are my two cents. Thank you. So I, I liked you brought up uh, chat GPT, the hot, hot button <laughs> for a lot of us nowadays. But uh, it's interesting that, uh, you know, we somehow think that technology will solve all issues. Uh, uh, and while technology could be a route to help us enable people who come from, uh, you know, diverse backgrounds, who come from very different uh, kind of opportunity spaces, but uh, it will not give us a solution unless we uh, as uh, people, I would say, uh, both in terms of business and as a society, uh, sort of take some steps. Uh, I thought I'll, I'll share an interesting trivia uh, with all of you, which might yet surprise you. You know, when we start talking about DEI, uh, we do a, a study with Gen Z, and, and one would assume that Gen Z is uh, very awake, they're very aware, uh, very savvy. Uh, we were doing a study with Gen Z where Gen Z women were asking their, their uh, colleagues uh, in terms of uh, a question which was about how many of you would want to earn more than your partner? Yeah, this is women who are doing MBA. So you, you can already imagine that they are a very exclusive set and, and they're talking to colleagues who are also doing MBA. Yeah, and almost 80% of the women in, in that group uh, said we would not like to earn more than our partner. So uh, this, this sort of uh, made us step back and think about the fact that DEI is not just a point that we raise in, in discussions like this. It's, it's a very deep-rooted societal thing. Uh, sometimes we don't understand from where uh, our, uh, our view on certain topics is coming, and that's why I want to go back to what Paulomi referred, uh, sympathy versus empathy. We, we all make the right sounds. Uh, we, we all say, yes, of course, we should do this. Uh, but are we really moving in that direction? And, and how do we check whether brands are really looking at this. Probably, Vishesh, it will happen when we start seeing whether brands are looking at it as a business imperative. Uh, Pallavi, you've done some initiatives, like you were mentioning Acid Attack. What is the impact on business that you see? How do you, how do you justify it, or, or how do you sort of align uh, a, a community of marketeers to say that, look, this is not just a good thing, moral thing, but this is also a relevant thing from a business point of view? So I'll, uh, I'll take this opportunity to tell you that, uh, as I said, we've been doing multiple campaigns. One such is with asset attack survivors. And I truly believe it's not one, but many that you do. So the last one, for example, in this, uh, in the same breath is what we did with an IPL association. 
uh, we associated with KKR Night Riders. And uh, the campaign that I launched at that point of time was called Being Equal. Now there was this very big question, why are you associating with IPL? You, your end consumer is female. Uh, I looked at it from a business perspective. I'll just give you three reasons why I was doing that. And then you can circle back that, you know, why, wh what was the manifestation of the brand so far? So A, uh, we are in the FMCG sector and it's a skincare brand. There are three different forms of sales, modern trade, this general trade, and e-commerce. And uh, Joy Personal Care is a brand which is a challenger brand in this space. There is yet a lot of people to know just like whether a man or a, a woman, in India today, I still believe the awareness of joy has to rise. So I was at the cusp of that. So while I was taking the sponsorship of KKR Knight Riders and focusing on West Bengal as a market, it allowed me to associate with my business partner in a very stronger way because the entire ecosystem of sales and distribution is dominated by me. And uh, <clears throat> that helped me get a lot of leverage into doing various activities that entail my trade partners to associate with me, to support with me, because they are men, they're watching cricket. Now, when I was taking the spots on TV, uh, they are very high GRP and high TVR, it allowed me to get the awareness factor of the brand much ahead of the curve, because obviously it's, it's one of the highest rated property in the country. That helped me to tick off the index of awareness. The campaign that I had designed was called Being Equal, wherein it's, uh, it where we you know, showcase the three important cricketers. And uh, the narrative of the creative was, why is it that uh, in the women, when the women play, there isn't the celebration much. That our game pe itna shor nahi hota hai, jitna aapke game pe hota hai. Khilari to hum do hi hai. In our country, cricket is a religion, but when it comes to the field, the kind of uh, celebration that you see around when men play and women play, there's a huge difference. Why is it that? And the narrative was not uh, a man versus woman again. It was done in a manner where I said it is the conditioning of the society which has not made us appreciate sports in general for women. Why is it? And we left that. Uh, last two years, we have, after uh, the top of mind recall of joy has gone more than 48%. Uh, I've been able to have a growth in each of my segment of, uh, you know, uh, e-commerce, modern trade, and uh, GT. The penetration level with my dealer distributors has gone up to at least 35%, okay, because they recognize me more. And the last thing that I felt was, why shouldn't we democratize sports? Uh, we are going into a, a zone where we have to get out of democratic targeting to psychographic targeting. When I have a property which is giving me a 40% split of women viewers, at the same time it is giving me an 18% stick, 18 minutes of stickiness, which is not a bad bet. So therefore, when I take, uh, being a woman's brand, I take up IPL, mm -hmm. and I have, uh, and you know, circle it back to why did I do this? Apart from DEI, this is how the DEI decision of mine has helped me in the business decision. It had three to four legs which I could cover through one association. The campaign spoke of being equal and as love would have it in the next five months, BCCI announced WPL and there was an equal pay announcement. I don't know whether we have been able to do this because of our campaign, but we definitely had a role to play in the charter at that point of time. Absolutely, so I think that, that's, that's uh, sort of giving us a lesson somewhere that if brands can think about DEI, not from a sympathy view, but, but in terms of really what could it mean in, in the world and how could it change things. I think uh, if, if they pick it up as a promise, that there is, there is potential in terms of driving business as well. Narayan, circling back to you, uh, you spoke about a larger platform in, in terms of you know looking uh, at uh, social sector. And, and how do you see this whole area coming alive in the social sector? Because it's again a topic everybody talks about, we are all very woke about it, but is it really making any changes at the grassroots level? So actually, can I connect it back to business as well, or unless you're going no, no, absolutely, to business absolutely. Uh, a little later? You know, I, I think between Polomi and Vishesh, 
um, they, they covered a few points on the spectrum of evolution, if you will, of how as industry, I'm not talking about our industry alone, yeah. as industry we are evolving, right? So from complete ignorance, whether willful or otherwise, we've went to representation, you know, hopefully beyond the token representation that Vishesh uh, was hoping for, uh, to um, empathy. But we need to push a lot farther, a lot harder, because ultimately, without people who have the lived experiences from which the solutions will come, we cannot best be superficial about it, right? Um, like one of the panelists in the previous session was saying, as a man, I never use lipstick, and I don't know that if I had to use <laughs> lipstick, I need to store it in the fridge, right? Only a woman could know that, right? In the same way, only a person who has survived an acid attack or is a burn victim would know what skincare routines are needed for uh, someone like that. Or I, I don't have a disability, so I don't know if I will stumble if I cross this threshold over here. Uh, but the more we bring people with the lived experiences into our teams, the better equipped we'll be, even for business growth, mm -hmm. because then it's not sympathy, it's not empathy, it's from lived realities that we are then able to spot business opportunities, right? And I'll connect it back to the social sector, right? I mean, one of the uh, big, big lacunae in the social sector, having worked in it for the last year, is the lack of resources. I mean, the passion, the purpose, and the will can take things that far. But the resources that industry has, if we were to commit the, a fraction of those resources to social progress, we'd be somewhere else, right? And, and we, we forever talk about innovation. There's no innovation shortage in the world, but there is progress shortage. And if only we could look at business through the lens of delivering progress. Uh, it, it's something that Den at Densu, we are now very actively saying we have to evolve from what Benjamin Franklin said in the 1800s, saying, you know, do well by doing good, to actually now you have to do well by doing right. And it's far tougher to do what is right, right? But if you can commit to it, then what you'll actually see is growth can happen because you will deliver social impact. It's not an addendum, it's not an accessory, it's not a side effect. You deliver social impact, you will deliver growth as well. And uh, that's the focus we are uh, looking to move towards as well. So I, I want to go back to what you said in the middle that, uh, you know, do we then get people with different experiences uh, as, as a part of our team? And, and does that uh, then help us build a vision for the future, which is not based on, uh, you know, what I have heard, but uh, something which has been lived and, and, and therefore uh, more real? And uh, Vishesh, I, I want to ask your point of view on this. I think technology can actually enable a lot of this. Today we have become uh, comfortable working across locations. We have become comfortable working with people from different countries, yeah? And uh, quite often there are, there are times you, you never meet the person in reality, in, in physical terms, but, but you know the person because, because you are engaging with them. Uh, you are possibly seeing how they live their lives. And, and what is the opportunity there for us to create shared uh, experiences which could help us drive this agenda further? So, uh, see, uh, fundamentally, my, you know, I have a problem with how DII is being spoken about in general. So just taking cue from what Pallavi mentioned that, you know, BCCI said now henceforth, women will also get the same pay as men, okay? And uh, we were happy, we have achieved DII. But was it just about, why do we pitch it as man versus woman every time? Every time we talk about DII, we just say, you know, women are not getting this, men are getting this, women should get this, the moment they feel we have got this, okay, it's done. I would have been more happy if uh, BCCI would have promoted you know, some sort of tournaments for physically disabled, some sort of tournaments for, you know, promotion for transgenders. They should have done those sort of things also, okay? Secondly, you know, uh, coming to technology side of it, while, of course, earlier there were challenges that probably, you know, uh, you can't reach out to different places if you have to work, you have to be in metro cities or probably big cities. And, uh, you know, not everyone could come to those side of uh, 
places and that's why a lot of people from our social strata uh, could not connect with those opportunities and this I do not just mean women I also mean people from different caste and creed people from different far off areas if someone from northeast yeah. Okay, typically they f don't get that kind of acceptance, you know, uh, what you usually get. So, in a virtual world and uh, probably pandemic gave that lead to us that, you know, we can create those hybrid, hybrid uh, uh, work ecosystem wherein people from different cars create probably can come and join the mainstream, you know, just a start. Secondly, apart from this, you know, if you look at how uh, the innovations are happening, you know, how uh, products are being proposed. Say, for example, I'll just give you, in India, while you look at financial products, okay, uh, they are mostly pitched in a certain way to a certain uh, community or people in general. But just quoting an example, in Muslims, they typically do not uh, invest in products which have interest income, okay? Now just a very, very small example to highlight a bigger picture. But nobody is thinking of creating the kind of products which will help them, you know, take care of their religious beliefs as well as, you know, also make sure that they can invest, okay? That's why a lot of, you know, this is not uh, just a random uh, f uh, theory, but because I speak to a lot of people for my consumer, uh, you know, research related stuff, a lot of Muslims do not participate in stock market because of this particular reason. Now, technology can help us create those kind of products, which will probably, you know, like how we have integrated with US stocks, you know, there are platforms, I won't name them right now, but there are platforms which help us invest in stock, US stocks. Can we create some sort of ecosystem so that people, you know, can invest in those kind of products, let's say from Middle East and those, and technology can definitely make it possible. So, you know, these are different ways, these are different innovative ways we have to look at, to cater to everyone's need. And, but before all of this, we need to have that mindset that DII is not just about man versus woman, it's about taking everyone along, building for everyone, providing for everyone. That's probably would be the right start, I would say. Thank you. Thank you, Vishesh. And uh, now we have run out of time on this exciting topic. So I hope uh, as a panel, we've, we've managed to get you all thinking what DEI really means, you know, should we widen the definition? And perhaps also like Narayan said, look inwards, you know, what is our perspective as a human being? What are we looking at? And how can we then connect it to what we do and, and make business solutions, uh, look at business ways of working, which will make it meaningful in the long term and not just a tick mark. Thank you all for a great discussion. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. Uh, I'll request you all to take a picture together. And as we are doing that, I'll request Mr. Atul Gandhi, Senior Vice President, Sales, Viacom 18 Sports, to kindly help us show our gratitude to all the speakers for that fabulous session. I'm sure you'll, you all enjoyed that conversation as much as we did. Let's have a round of applause for all of them. You all to stay back on the stage for a bit, all of you, just one minute. If you can do the honors, thank you so much.